Okay, hi guys, I'm Luke and thanks for joining me today for um, my presentation on um, exercise prescription. Um, and I don't have long, so I'm gonna dive straight in because I want to try and keep the, uh, the emphasis of what I share this session um, much more towards um, practical demonstrations of a constraints-led approach that we've been using for the past um, five years. If you've been following, for example, um, Craig Lieberson's webinars recently where he's been hosting guests talking a lot about the direction of rehabilitation and um, how we work with patients and the direction that things are going to have to go in the landscape is changing. Um, so what my intention is, is this in this session is um, to try not to ramble on too much. It's a long presentation. Um, so you're going to see my screen where I'm going to be linking to some videos that are connected to YouTube on, on some of these concepts. Uh, I'm not going to cover everything. Um, for the guys of you who have upgraded, I'm going to create a list of um, YouTube links to all of the exercises and videos that I've got in this presentation because we can't go through them all. Um, and I will get that across um, to you. But the field of rehabilitation is changing and that's straight off the bat what I want to address is the concept that of what is our end goal because that's what we're always going to be working backwards from in creating a rehabilitation program and are we rehabilitating robots or humans which is a fundamental difference underpinning the end goal of all the concepts that a constraints-led approach and what we use a lot is versions of dance and movement therapy to be able to get people towards what we strive for as thoughtless fearless relaxed movement that louis gifford coined um, and if our end goal is that we are looking to return people to thoughtless fearless relaxed movement then the One second, I'm going to just get this screen share sorted. Screen share, get my presentation on the screen. Cool. Quite new to this new new revolution that we're in, but um, but yeah, if our if our yardstick or our goal is to return people to thoughtless, fearless, relaxed movement. How, has a, how does our more contemporary approaches to exercise prescription um, marry up with getting people to being able to play golf again, to being able to pick people up from the floor, to being able to get back to sports? At what point, you know, life and games and work is unpredictable, it's variable. And that's where a non-linear approach to, um, to returning or preparing for some, somebody for that is what this presentation is is really all about so something that is going to be i'm going to skim through a lot of these slides um, but the con there's a concept of ecological dynamics which ultimately talks about how behavior has to be intimately we have to view it intimately entwined with the environment that it's taking place in we can't separate the two so at what point do we um, do we do we manipulate our environment or produce or work with a um, work with the fact that the the end goal is where we're trying to get them to, which we've obviously got in our in our history, etc. Ecological dynamics is this performer environment relationship, and that is ultimately what um, what this, what, what, what I'm going to be presenting is if we want someone to be able to bend down and pick up a, an object that's awkward on the floor as part of their job is our exercise, is our training, um, preparing people for that. And what this VAS paper short talks through is that effective rehabilitation simply has to move beyond um, minimizing pathology and symptoms and require promotion of an individual's activity and in the relevant context. 
affordances are something that are going to be important as a concept but what they ultimately are is creating a situation that gives someone the choice or the opportunity to produce something so if it is that we want to be able to um, give someone the chance to be able to bend down without it being something that we tell them to do or that we get them to really think about how do we create a situation how do we create a scenario where that opportunity is afforded them for that to happen similarly if we wanted to give someone the chance to be able to lift overhead and we know that thoughtless fearless is that the end goal of, of, of where we want to be able to go how do we build in affordances into what we are working with representative representative design is another key pillar of ecological dynamics and what that basically talks about is the more representative a practice environment is the more likely that our perception and action couples neurons that fire together wire together will transfer to the performance environment if anyone has had any backgrounds in combat sports or martial arts and have prepared for a fight without doing sparring actually fighting people replicating the scenario of the performance they will tell you that they will not be as prepared if they had just gone in on pad work etc not replicating the the things that they're seeing from their opponent who's actually going to be throwing um throwing shots that is going to influence whether and how we defend and how we move so similarly if we were to look at something like um a ball machine that bowls down to a tennis player so you can practice hitting back it may look and start in the same place of where the ball is hit by a, by an opponent however a skilled opponent like roger federer or Novak Djokovic is doing everything they can to disguise and hide the key indicators as to where that serve is going to go. So even though it may be hit from the same place, the real cues that a skilled tennis player will be looking for is not where the ball is coming from, but the person that's hitting it. So if we spend all our time training on a machine, is that preparing us for the performance, environment, perception, action couples? That is probably going to be no and where this is going to be tied for us is that a lot of this stuff is in the performance or coaching realm and it is going and the future is moving very swiftly towards at what point in an injury pathway or rehabilitation do we have the same approach to okay so if someone normally can bend down and pick something up and they stop doing that for a period of time how do we create a practice environment? How do we create a rehabilitation environment that replicates what we ultimately want them to be able to do? Do we want them, someone bending down, thinking about, right, I need to squeeze my glutes, I have to activate my transverse abdominis, I need to keep my spine long, I need to be able to make sure I've got a chin tuck to be able to bend down, pick something up from the floor, which is common information that we might be told, bend with your knees, not your back, on a manual handling course, but it's a different reality to actually the world that we live in the world is awkward the world is variable we have to be able to pick things up and if you watch people well into old age who do it all of their life watch anyone around you people when they stop thinking about things they just do it are they prepared to be able to do it is there other things that's priming their nervous system for protection then that's an individual case by case but we're going to be looking at tasks and dance movement therapy for returning people to what lou gifford would describe as thoughtless fearless and relaxed movement i did a presentation a while back on this concept of how we are clouds and not clocks clocks being much more um, analogous to the um the biomechanical nature that we are like a machine some of our parts is equal um as opposed to a clock, which is a much more complex system. And when we look at non-linear dynamics, this is what we see um, some, some fundamental differences between a linear system like a machine where if you give, if a, pipe is, if a pipe is this big and we change it to this big, there will be a proportional change in what can pass through that pipe as we have increased the space. However, if we were to look at a non-linear system, so 
uh, a human, which is what we are, um, and put on a runner machine, and we increase the machine by 0.1, and then we increase the machine by 0.1, and then we increase the machine by 0.1. We keep increasing by that small amount, and we will walk a little bit faster, but at some critical point, there will be a sudden change from walking to running. You get a big change, a disproportionate output to the point one that was put in because we are a non-linear system. Equally, if we were to be working at, uh, with something like a team sports basketball and we are in a small space and we are able to pass in any direction, one small subtle change to, okay, we can't pass the ball overhead is going to cause a disproportionately large change in the behavior of the um, systems or the people involved because they have to find new ways to be able to move because they can't pass the ball overhead. Uh, working along those lines, a non-linear system has multi-stability. So if I was to receive a ball to this height, I could, if we're talking about football, I could chest the ball, I could shoulder the ball, I could head the ball. There would be lots of different outputs that I could respond to that input, whereas a a linear system will always have the same cause and effect. Parametric control, just by manipulating the size of the court. Five, five aside football, for example, if we've got five side football playing on a badminton court, it's gonna be lots of, lots of bodies, really nice and really close, so it's gonna be fizzing around, the ball's gonna be turning over a lot between people getting the ball off each other. If we play that, if we just then simply change the parameters of the field, and open that out to a full-size football pitch, lots of space going to be a drastic change in the behavior of the system purely by changing the parameters. And something that we see a lot of in um, the pain science world, and, uh, and that's movement variability or noise. In a, um, in a car, if we've got noise in a system, it's probably a sign that we've got something wrong and we need to get it fixed noise or variability in a dynamic system like a human is a sign of a healthy system able to adapt able to find multiple solutions so that leads us into the um the three main pillars in which how a human can interact with the environment and that tees us up for the constraints led approach which has got the three main points that you see there that will underpin how that system processes the constraints that are placed on it for what comes out coordinated skill skill or skill acquisition okay and the first one is something that we often can't do much about and that's performer constraints how tall we are how long our femur is i for example have no internal rotation in my hips so that would be an individual performer constraint on some of my goals which are gymnastic based that my anatomy is a constraint that i'm probably not going to be able to get a middle split or a box split whereas my long femurs are something that make running for example a an advantage if we're short we're probably not going to become a international level basketball player it's just the nature of the fact that we have a constraint that impacts what we're going to be able to do and this transcends beyond just the physical because our beliefs and our understanding are also really strong constraints around movements. You know, if I think that I've got, if I believe that I've got um, a bulging disc that is pressing on my nerve, that's causing my back pain, you know, is that belief going to be one that's conducive with moving nice and relaxed and just getting on with my daily, daily life? Or is it going to be one that's going to be probably leading to more protective guarded movement and maladaptive avoidance? And this is the A, B, C, D, E, F, W that we use to gather those beliefs that we may or may not want to challenge if we reason that they're maladaptive to be able to get someone to be able to move. A couple of infographics that we use there to be able to connect pain to some of these beliefs and things that impact our nervous system. But the next pillar on a constraints-led approach is environmental constraints. And that's going to impact all of us differently, where we work, if we work in a clinic, if we work in a gym, 
I spend a lot of my time at the moment working outside in parks and these are constraints. These can act in different ways. What's our medical, uh, uh, um, what's our religious background? Does that, does that prevent us from participating in sports? These are things that influence what we're going to be able to do. I've grown up here in Wales. Um, am I more or less likely to become or go down a pathway of rugby compared to cross-country skiing? The answer is probably no, and that's where I spend a lot of my time. Whereas Aspion and Pertu and some of my some of our back to roots guys in Scandinavia, their environment is going to be much more supportive of going down a cross country skiing route. Um, and if we were to have a look at how environmental constraints sculpts and molds behaviour, it's there's no better case than the case of the Brazilian Palada where the development of street football. So being able to use these really small confined spaces to be able to play with, um, to be able to play football often with no shoes and with lots of kids crowded and it becoming a real cultural identity that then when you release the parametric controls of the pitch, increase the space, all that deception, flair and guile that we see as the hallmark of Brazilian uh, football is probably attribu attributable to, or argument ar arguably attributable to the environmental constraints in the culture there. And very much along the same lines of something else that I'm very, very influenced by today is capoeira, which evolves out of the same, the same street origins. And the research by Wormhout et al, which um, I present at the end of this, which is the, the athletic skills model for developing a truly non-linear pedagogy in, um, in adolescence is based on the fact that we know that people play significantly less in the streets these days than they did 20 years ago, which is the origins of where a lot of creativity is born. It's where a lot of, I tell a story at the start, it's linked to um, the first slide where a lot of the origins of back to roots was the environmental constraints. We didn't have a clinic, we didn't have a gym. We had to develop the resourcefulness to be able to work within having nothing. And that's where um, I think a lot of a lot of us can learn something about manipulating environmental constraints, especially in this time of um, where we're not able to be in gyms and clinics. Can we really exploit? Can we become architects of the environment? And that leads us into the final one, which is task constraints. And it's probably what we're no, most well known for is because this is the one that we have the most control of. This is where we make the rules of the game, the equipment, we can change the rules at any point. And this is really limited by our own experience and the, um, whether it's suitable or not for a person at a given time. But what working or creating a task enables us to manipulate task constraints to afford learners opportunities to acquire individualized optimal movement patterns that take into account their own variations in, in performer constraints as well as how these performer constraints interact with the environment and task constraints. All of these interact synergistically. Individual differences among learners are inherent and while the general shape of the movement could be acknowledged and identifiable, individual variations will be present and should be accepted as the norm rather than as exceptions. And this is something that if I could turn back the clock and have had someone have guide me through my studies, when I was going through college as a chiropractor, I was having people doing x-rays and drawing all over my hips. The fact that I've got no internal rotation research tells us that if we are going to have no internal rotation in our hips, it's going to predispose us to OA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this person, to do this on screen here now if i stand up and i put myself into this position of 1990 if i try and take my foot out here to this position i have less than five degrees of internal rotation immediate hip impingement in my medial fit, medial um medial groin so 
Is that something that you can stretch away, mobilize? That's what I was told for 10 years. No one stretched more than me, and guess what? My internal rotation has not changed. But can we improve it? Can we have a task so that someone who has a performer constraint like mine cannot be pathologized and have x-rays and images and all these all these medicalizations of something that's probably normal to then afford me the opportunity to be able to solve things a different way to somebody else some of you guys watching this here will have 90 degrees of internal rotation so how are, are me and you ever going to do a squat that looks the same you know i always remember going on a dns course where i was taught taught that at 12 months and I, I was pulled up in front of the class to do this perfect squat which involved looking like a one-year-old baby and having this bolt upright spine and the, the woman put, pulled me out i was an international rugby player at the time put me into this position and i just fell backwards because i've got long femurs my anatomy just does not make a squat the same as this ideal model yeah i can squat pretty well i've squatted um two and a half times body weight i've I'm able to get down to, to the floor and move in and out of the position. And that's what this task approach affords, trying to shift away and help us find what those individual solutions are. And we can, you know, if we've got a squat, a deadlift, maybe pat, there's pattern and characteristics of that that will be identifiable and look the same. But we are going to look different based on our individual performer constraints. So that's what this task is all about. So if I'm working and I'm trying to return somebody back to, you know, that's something I can't talk about individual cases here. So you'll have to use what I do want to provide you with is some ideas for tasks to be able to run with and then be able to see how you might manipulate the constraints for a person where they're at, meeting them where they're at, and then looking at where we want to get them to. Maybe it's sport, maybe it is just being able to pick something up from the ground. A useful reference point that I have found and we have found with working with people in persistent pain is simply getting them to be able to move thoughtless, being able to move relaxed and doing things that are meaningful to them. So here's a few examples that I've filmed for how we could create a task that would encompass and facilitate someone who has for example, no internal rotation in the hip like myself. You could add any individual variance that you come across instead of my internal rotation. But if I wanted to create a task that would afford someone the opportunity to be able to experience low back flexion without telling them how they're going to do it, because they may not look the same as mine, but we want them to experience it then we could create a task, for example, like this, where I will place some constraints and say that I can only stand on the one leg and that foot can't pivot. Okay, so constraints, a lot of people miss the, or misinterpret constraints. Constraints don't limit you. They afford you to explore, from, explore movement solutions. So in this task here, by me not being able to pivot that left foot, for more than two degrees on a clock. So I imagine I'm stood on a clock and my foot is at 12, points towards 12 o'clock. And then I've got one, two, one, two, three, all the way around. I can only turn the, the foot to one o'clock or 11 o'clock. The second constraint would be that the foot can't touch the floor, the other foot. And the third constraint would be the task, which one of, in this particular one, I wanted to give an opportunity for someone to experience low back flexion. So the task is placing objects on the floor without the hips going below the knee. So by giving those rules now, I've given some, some parameters for which someone to explore, putting three objects on the floor at 12 o'clock, three o'clock and nine o'clock, and then, and only then to be able to explore how far can they reach with the object? My, sorry, my flag has just come down behind me there. Oh, my parents have nothing ever, nothing ever goes to plan. Um, so nothing different there. But that task there, um, 
we call drop it like it's not and it is a really nice task for giving someone the chance to be able to explore a low back flexion in different directions maybe i want to change the emphasis of the task for a case where i want someone to be able to explore knee and ankle emphasis of movement maybe you want to return someone to ankle inversion maybe we want someone to be able to develop the ability to stabilize on single leg and develop a, a isometric or a, a load to the patella tendon I'm not giving clinical reasoning here but in this task there's a imaginary barrier right in front of my chest that i can't pass through and then i'm going to place the three objects on the floor um, and then touch the objects without pivoting the standing foot and then touching the floor as if i'm tasting testing the water temperature in a bath to be able to demonstrate control without passing through the barrier and in in not breaking those rules it's going to cause me to have to explore some really interesting ranges of movement with my ankle and knee that will require me to complete the task and if i can complete the task then we move it further out and increase the demands for strength range of movement etc but the task is facilitated of the fact that i don't have internal rotation so how am i going to solve it how are you going to solve it that would be part of seeing what emerges through putting someone into a task like this and seeing what happens then do we change the constraints as we go this is a task that would be a subtle change now so i can place the foot on the floor and i have to then push the object as far as i can but pull back off that reaching leg without pushing and this puts uh, a real emphasis on so i can pass through there's no barrier here now this is a task that would be an emphasis on the adductors or the hips i'm going to push that object as far as i can now and this leg here stays fixed still can't pivot and i've got to be able to pull back to the start position what happens if we do that moving out to that direction look at the angles and the ranges in the in the ankle and the knee the strength and balance balance required to pull back also will add that it's easier to do this task on a slidey floor than it is on um, concrete floor. You'll have to be willing to scuff a couple of shoes, but um, if you want to do that on on a floor there, but a tough task that is an emphasis for um, for hips. But what about upper body? So here's an example of again combining environmental constraints for getting into a shoulder balance uh, hand balance grip type task where we could set the task being entering an object in this case a tree in one place and then exiting another the beautiful thing about using tasks like um like this is that trees are everywhere people have access to them they just need a compass or a gps to direct the activity or creativity to let it flow and that's really what i want to add as well is that in my experience people don't lack creativity a lot of people say that we're very creative at back to roots we come up with all these things we meet I, I immerse myself in lots of practices i've got a lot of amazing teachers that inspire the ideas that i then bring into clinical practice but generally people don't lack creativity i think we just lack being guided and then letting creativity flow. So in a slightly slight variation of that of that previous task, um, this is a climb moment where you get um, you start at one point A, can you get to point B? So in this case, around this side of this tree, and added constraint, feet must stay above hips. Simple as that. Enormous change in the demand for upper body strength to be able to pass through a task here and 
again, people will often say, well, I don't have that tree around me, but if I just cast your eyes to the background of this clip, this is my local park where I walk every day and I have done since I was a kid, as this lady is here. Just look at this tree here. Just look at this tree here. Just look at this tree here. Look at this tree here. Look at this tree here. Every one of them is an opportunity to do a task like this, which I call a, a 360 traverse or A to B, for being able to really challenge and play with coming up. So how would you, what, in what ways could you, could you really challenge yourself to be able to, to be able to, to make that task slightly, slightly different? You know, is there um, a wall that we can use? So this is another one that I've taken um, on my local railway bridge just up from my house. Um, but being able to get um, use of something, this is a climbing drill. I use this a lot with people with shoulders and just getting people to start be creative in what they have around them. So in this task, get onto the wall. Chalk helps, I've got some. If you haven't, find something that you can get onto and then simply trying to take one point of contact off the wall, four sets of, well, first and foremost, can you do it? Then maybe sets of time, because if you want to then be able to traverse the wall, climb the wall, you need to be able to shift tension, really rock solid at one point, and then being able to be dexterous, problem solve at, um, at the same time. Um, so that's a, a really interesting climbing task that we use. What about balance? So here's an example. A lot of a lot of <clears throat> a lot of things that uh, our programs that we use has um, components of balancing for moving low back for lower limb um, proprioceptive work. Here is a sideways rail task that we might set for developing the ability. Can you simply stay on parallel to the to the rail that we're on. Slightly different variation, forward balance. So both feet, you'll be probably surprised that that's actually more difficult. The surface area that you're using is more challenging. To be able to maintain that position is a really interesting task that you should probably find that you will adapt quite quickly by doing it. Um, but see how you get on, see what, see what the difference changing the object that you're balancing on is um offers you a thin metal rail is a very different one to the fence post that i'm that i'm sharing here same concept a to b so you start com combining tasks together get from this point get to that point problem solving you've got to be prepared and willing to fall off maybe it'd be more appropriate you know when you're looking at these things now don't don't fall into the trap of well i can't do that because what this concept is all about is, okay, can you look at that and say, right, how would I make that easier? So is there a way that you could put a, um, a beam on the floor to be able to then practice balancing? You know, there's a lot of the things that we use and manipulate in gyms is wobble boards and all these things. Can we simply use a fence post to be able to, um, to be able to get access to some more, interesting balance tasks and this is one that again i've got vi variations on my youtube for showing how we would do this on a balance beam on the floor but this is using a stone and adding a perturbation so simply combining and being able to see can i manage a there's an element that i am in control still here but can i manage the weight shift and still balance and stabilize really difficult task that that um builds on or builds towards some of the more variable movements that um, you can try for yourself and maybe try, try with other people. And here's an example of me and Paul in Australia last year on our tour. Um, some of you will know that Paul ruptured his Achilles and this is part of the rehab that we were doing with him. We were on the road and we were using the proprioceptive resourcefulness that a simple balance beam affords us of course we were made sure that he was safe to be able to come down and land from there and progressed up to this safely but this formed a really integral part to paul's to paul's rehabilitation <clears throat> 
so in light of in light of that and sharing a few examples you should be able to look at this slide here with a stick on the foot ball on string ball on the wall ball clutching the contact and be able to say well can i work out what the task might be there and how might i then change it do these tasks only apply to movement variability and novel ways of moving absolutely not and that's where what i said before about how a deadlift pattern or a squat might look identifiable but we would do it in different ways and there's still scope and we use the example of envelope of function for load tolerance and conditioning for building the ability to work out of alignment using awkward objects to be able to condition ourselves to the fact that that's actually how talking about ecological dynamics that is how the real world is we've got to pick stuff up from the floor we've got to be able the weight will be dependent on the person and this is a task that i use lift it and it's something that i will want to expose people to maybe further down the rehabilitation pathway for being able to build up robustness or people's levels of robustness for being able to manage simply picking up something heavy from the floor can you find something that challenges you just like a rock climb where you just can't quite get it can you find something that you need to try and lift and you have to just keep trying to figure out how you're going to get it up that's when you're finding the right level of challenge and engagement for cultivating a sense of flow even in the presence of really high load work here's an example i pulled these stones out of my stream it's something that i'm using at the moment with um with heavy resistance work because i can't access a gym certainly not as much as i used to and being able to find ways look at all that low back flexion knee valgus all these biomechanical things that we're probably probably taught in in, in some point that it's bad oh look at that knee valgus but it's the most efficient way that i was going to get that stone up to that position so the concept of tasks is relevant across the board and the manipulation of constraints helps us scope uh, scope what the movement might look like and <clears throat> i'm not going to spend too much time on attention but um, it is important it's something that nick winkerman um, has brought a shed a real light on in terms of highlighting the importance of external cueing and this is a paper that he pulled from gabrielle wolf um that really did that really gives the weight of the evidence to the superiority of external focuses of attention over internal and if i just whistle stop guide you through this because in his book the language of coaching he goes into much more depth on all this than than, than i have time to today but on this graph we have people on a loft in trial they're trying to pitch the ball up and hit a target and over six trials and these people were given um, internal cues or an external cue and also some of them 100 percent of the time some of them 33 percent of the time so seeing did how often we cue have an impact and what the top two lines here show are the accuracy of the external cues over six trials just coming out superior to the internal cues but also this break illustrates um, going away then after the teaching and then coming back having a go at the task without being told anything and seeing what's stuck and again the external cues come out superior and if i just draw your attention to these two lines down here this is the internal cues who were given every third rep 33 percent of the time and 100 percent of the time so the more internal cueing that someone gets the worse they do so we almost have a case well, we have a clear case here for almost like a dose response internal cueing so focus on where your knee is focusing on keeping your back straight focus on being able to dorsiflex your foot being able to keep your glutes tight all these internal cues that we are we all will be guilty of i know i have and i certainly still find that when i'm coaching handstands and certain things that the tendency is to be able to give in this internal language external just comes out and the more internal that we give the worse someone does and this pans out in strength tasks lifting this top one here is a, a deadlift task or a rack pull where if you focus on pushing the ground as hard and fast as you can over contracting your legs as hard as fast as you can you produce more force with an external cue 
similarly with forced production. So this port of paper that Nick Winkleman um, uses as well is about the produ production of power and how far away an external queue is. So if I want to be able to jump far away as, or as far as I can, which is what this test was, being able to focus on jumping as far past the line as I can, as opposed to extending my knees as fast as possible, is going to lead to, in that study, it showed a 10 centimeters increase just in one session on a task like this. So this is, this is a, a power measure that, we, um, that I like to use. It's from parkour, where it's a measure of, can you jump, standing broad jump, the length of your overhead height? stick it and land and what the porter's studies show that is if we have an external focus of focus of attention so on this task here if i'm looking at trying to so if i just pause this here if i'm looking at trying to jump to that fence here that is going to harness me to produce more force than to focus on anything to do with my body and that's what the um that's what the research on external queuing shows across force production too, which again makes sense. <clears throat> the very nature of internal queuing or the very nature of injury draws our attention to it. And what this paper showed is that even beyond, even beyond getting out of rehabilitation and back to return to play, baseball Baseball players were more accurate at knowing where their body was rather than the ball on a simulation test, um, which is which is a very interesting one. Again, good, good to Nick Blinkman to learn more about that. But post-injury, people are still more focused if they have, if I show on this graph, graph here, experts who, who haven't had an injury were much more accurate at knowing where the ball was as opposed to expert baseball players who had had a knee injury and they were much more aware or more accurate when asked on a, on a, on a beeper test where their knee was. So they hadn't had that focus of attention shifted from the injury back out of their body and into the environment. And that's something that I think is important for us as healthcare professionals because data here also shows that 67% of the time in physical therapists we're using internal cueing language, you know, back straight, squeeze your glutes, chin tucked, scapula set. This internal language is something that we are using primarily. Marry that with the fact that injury or pain with itself causes an internal focus of attention. And then we have a mechanism for trying to really help us get at what point should we be trying to get people out of their body and back into the environment thoughtless fearless relaxed movement how much is our exercise prescription task facilitating facilitating getting people out of their body i'm not going to go into the the, the choking literature too much um, but that's uh, something again that shows that people need to be able to get out of their bodies and get into focusing on the outcome of the task is there a place for internal focus um, potentially early stage of rehabilitation or bodybuilding where if you for example in this paper give someone the task of a plantar flexion and you ask them to push the plate away as hard as they can an external focus or squeeze the calf as hard as you can what we see in the external focus is that the tibialis anterior doesn't work as much on emg traces where in the internal squeeze your calf as hard as you can it does so again that makes sense if we want to be able to produce force, then we probably don't want the tibialis anterior to be acting like a, like a handbrake. But if we want a co-contraction or we want to be able to have hypertrophy of that muscle in bodybuilding, then it is potentially um, a place for it. But we probably want to be shifting to external focus as much as we can. And if you can marry up that awareness with external focus and you follow us on social media and you see us using sticks, you see us using balls, you see us coming up with these games, it's really harnessing the power of external focus to give someone or afford someone the opportunity to be able to explore new movement patterns. In this example here, if I want someone to be able to explore spinal flexion and I create a task that that has to happen by shifting this ball from here to here, then it is 
it is the external focus of the ball rather than thinking about the spine and how the spine moves. Equally, if I want someone to explore bending and I come up with a task and some constraints around people's feet not being able to move and make it interactive, then we can give someone the opportunity to explore those movements. <coughs> and hopefully you can look at that slide and be able to again get some ideas around the importance of external cues in your rehabilitation and your exercise prescription because why it's probably so superior to internal focus or attention is this concept of self-organization this is a murmuring of starlings where if you go outside and have a look before dusk you may see these amazing shapes of thousands of birds with not one of them in charge not one of them knows what they're doing but it just emerges that these shapes based on the behavior of the other birds based on the environment based on the weather as to what comes out and that is an example of a complex system that is the same in all biological complex systems so external focuses of attention seem to facilitate the chance for us to harness self <coughs> self-organization even in the presence of no internal rotation in our hip for example with me metaphor is something that we are um, probably familiar with it's how we communicate it's how we learn we grow up with making connections with something that we are unfamiliar with and connecting to something that we are familiar with to be able to communicate it is common that we will hear these things in clinic my muscles are knotted my back is out catching my shoulder pinch nerve i've got a glass back pain comes in waves and these are metaphors and analogies that cut both ways you know if i've got a a rusty this idea of a rusted hinge in my head for my elbow is that going to produce relaxed movement that we maybe want to restore probably not but this is something that nick winkelman uses in coaching to facilitate um, self-organization within athletics or sprinting by splitting up analogies and metaphors move as if scenario based if you want to drive sprint and we know that you want a high knee drift we uh, knee drive with a, a horizontal body line taking off all of these characteristics but how do we get that across without using that internal language then coming up with an example running uphill every time you strive forward hitting or smashing the glass move as if or embody a plane taking off and seeing if these images that we can encapsulate do they facilitate us becoming and self-organizing into those just using tape on a body part has been shown to help facilitate superior performance outcomes so in a jumping study just putting green tape on someone's study uh, tummy and getting them to jump as high as they can over a beam in high jumping has been shown to be superior so i know that nick uses that in sprinting where he'll put green tape on someone's knee and cue them to be able to drive the green tape as fast forward and smash that glass as they can rather than talking about this internal language of the knee so how do we utilize something like that in returning someone to thoughtless fearless relaxed movement this is a task that i have taken from one of my teachers matt who is a movement practitioner where you see me here this is live footage of me working with john who has had persistent pain and i give a contact to his base of his skull and to his top of his pelvis to give him more awareness to those, to those two body parts a bit like the green tape and ask him to move those two points around the space imagine there's a string connecting those two points and you're going to try and just move those two points of around in space as much as you can can you move like a puppet like a puppet imagine water flowing can you embody how we might move that string connecting these two points in a relaxed way and here's some examples of me moving to show how um, i might respond to that task um, unfortunately i'm not going to share with you how john did it because this is um, 
the type, this type of movement is something that people can feel a little bit self 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 conscious of. But if we can facilitate and make someone feel safe, then it is amazing how much of an impact getting someone to break down tensions in a task like this can be. So I'm not going to go into because I'm aware of time too much about how we would put this together because it probably involves a shift in um, business model and clinical model for working, um, truly working with within this framework because it takes more time. Um, but the goal would always be to start in a more isolated way, so coming up with quite limited constraints and then working towards more releasing the constraints to a more improv 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 or improvisational you know being able to let people play the sport but you've worked on something something more focused or constrained before that before you release it or movement and the art of changing those constraints is truly the uh, the changing and manipulating those constraints is really the art of uh, of coaching and understanding the science to be able to be able to know when someone needs those changed so i'm just moving through a couple of case examples here because i want to get to some videos that we use um, from self-determination theory and non-linear pedagogy because they go really well together but ultimately being able to satisfy three human basic needs autonomy is the desire to express choice and feel involved and not compelled to do something competence is a belief that your abilities are it's within your capacity to control outcomes and relatedness, feel connected, feel involved, and um, experience satisfying interpersonal relationships. These are the things that we need as basic psychological needs, as it's called, and <clears throat> trying to create an environment that supports that, giving people a positive experience with, with movement to give someone the chance, the best chance to want to drive their motivation internal. We know that people with persistent pain have an external locus of control, leads to them seeking out healthcare. Um, but I think it's our job as practitioners to really create an environment within uh, where intrinsic motivation can flourish and make people, or give people, or afford people the opportunity to want to do something. And that's where I think we start really impacting the global burden of physical inactivity and um, picking up and really getting people to engage because we've got a massive Lib we've got a real liberating landscape of things that can really help us with um with helping people to find something that they enjoy and that's what the ultimately the goal of dance and movement therapy which is something that this min jung paper you can check out for yourself um when you've got a little bit more time what that does and the two main things that come out of that paper which is the closest thing i would say to how we work is loosening up and broaden build effect. So we talk about self-efficacy and what people experienced was a release of tension, rigidity, and an increased sense of flow and flexibility at all levels, physical, emotional, cognitive, and social. The issue of rigidity, you know, when someone's got pain, if I've got pain, it's, a, it's demanding protection. Am I going to be relaxed or am I going to be holding tension? So adding an exercise that is going to require someone to do a sit-up or something that requires tension-based work is that and adding to the problem or breaking things up. And that is where dance and movement therapy, which is a little bit along the lines of that sacral occipital drill that you saw me doing there with John, help people experience feelings such as joy, excitement, relaxation, hope, gratitude, sense of flow and social connectedness, especially in a time like now where we are very limited from what we can do and here's a quote from someone who in the Ming Jun paper there you can relax and be silly find yourself laughing and being playful people learn easier when they're in a relaxed and playful mode and something that is incredibly powerful that is the first thing people say when they come to our uh, or they've heard of Bat Roots is play and that is because it is so versatile that it encompasses all of these and we ultimately have to play the biggest drivers of exercise adherence are joy and passion. So how do we create tasks that facilitate breaking down tension, holding tension in one body part while simultaneously releasing tension in another body part, like we might see in an animal or we might see in a beautiful mover 
that is an expertise of their craft. This is something that we use called clay, and this is me working with um, with someone to embody that they are clay and I'm molding them. They can't give me resistance, but then when I leave them alone, they've got to hold that position, move people in and out of really tough tension positions and <clears throat> demand that they can relax at the same time. This is a game called Magnets. I'm rattling through these here and now at the end to just give you an exposure, but if you get the list, you'll be able to watch all of these but coming up with a task here where my body is magnetically attracted to points that John can touch. And I have to respond as locally as I can to be able to move and maintain the contact of the magnet. You see John here really challenging me into some spinal isolations to be able to to move in and out of that position. And here's an example of how we might want to break down muscular tensions. What we call breaking posture. Just responding to what I'm asking. And if what will tend to happen, people will start guessing what they did, and then they'll ask to close your eyes. Okay, so now you've purely got to be able to respond. I don't want to feel any resistance. You can look at this task and try and figure out what constraints have I put on to try and get this person to experience relaxed movement. Because it's how all of us probably enter the room and trying to get rid of some of these global tension Most strategies. Yeah, you've got that. I don't have to feel if I'm getting in the it feels good when you can relax. Again, taken from our tour in Australia last year. And this is a, a concept we use called arteries. You'll see a lot of people doing this with sticks, etc. but using body parts as external cues, placing constraints on other body parts that can't move. So, for example, feet, and then exploring using the idea of lightsabers or body parts to give someone afford someone the opportunity to move with the head, with the back, with the hips, and you can progress that to more plyometric things if it is something that is relevant um, for, for that person. And something that I hear a lot is that we are chiropractors and do we do manipulate manipulation? And I think it's ma manipulation with movement therapy goes hand in hand and it's something that we will be challenged to move more and more towards a practice that is facilitating active care and here's an example of me working with john and external cues of the wall to try and drive some thoracic extension that is just part of the goal of this program was to return him to relaxed spinal movement and he's struggling to move through that position there so within the session I can get him into a position and I'm by no means an expert manipulator. A lot of you guys watching will be able to teach me a lot more about manipulation than I'll teach you. But what I want to be able to illustrate here is how manipulation and movement therapy to be able to get someone to experience that movement before and after straight back in. And what John described there is his ability to feel that he can move through those joints much more accurately after we put a manipulation through there. So we need to be able to work through giving people the chance to make errors, giving people the chance to feel vulnerable and provide non-judgmental, non-forceful therapeutic support. Focusing on developing self-awareness um, and a lot of that comes through conversation. A lot of the richest information on the communication is conversational throughout and here is one of the things i want to finish with is how i might wrap up a session to be able to to, to to culminate what we have covered and get that feedback from after some clay that we've just done as you try and excuse my trousers really really nice 
would be really nice. Let's fill in what I guess to kind of just really try and explore what I can do. So that's the game that I use. I call play. That's the information is that. Um, training for loops and really tough strength training. Cause was really nice for breaking down tension. So just when I'm getting really tired, I can see how to make this just a bit easier. It's more about movement localization, etc. So I think good session. Enjoy that. Yeah, it's interesting. Fun for some reason. It is different, isn't it? It's just, yeah, it's tough. Man, my clock time flies. Yeah. So if you couldn't make that out there, what John said was it was fun and it was different. Being different isn't necessarily better. I could put my pants on on top of my trousers to come to work today. It doesn't mean it's necessarily better, but making things fun, making things meaningful, making things relevant is probably our ultimate goal. So dance and movement therapy is something that is incredibly powerful when working with a constraints-based approach in the framework of returning people to thoughtless fearless relaxed movement and you should really be able to draw on any movement or physical practices that you have to guide what tasks that you would put someone into to give them a chance of experience experiencing it and here's some examples of that where I, we use puzzles we get people rolling on the floor we get people experiencing you know i've got a background in boxing and capoeira and lots of different things that are going to guide what i feel comfortable doing to create those tasks and then manipulate the constraints if i can then marry that up with what are the really meaningful goals for that person to get them to experience a positive journey with movement that is our ultimate goal and something that is um, i've put in here i have no time to really go into it <coughs> But it's the athletic skills model, which is non-linear pedagogy taken out of physical education. That is what underpins really our approach to facilitating a broad curriculum in what I would or any of our guys would try and expose somebody to in their rehabilitation. Ten basic movement skills, balancing and falling, romping and fighting, moving and locomotion, jumping, landing, rolling, tumbling and turning, throwing, catching, kicking climbing scrambling swinging and the bottom one there movement in motion it's the rhythm component that i think is what people are really self-conscious about it's a massively lacking component in a lot of programs that um i've got a link here uh, here we develop physicality body last year um, you don't need, you don't need to have advanced equipment. You just need to have creativity with another example of why I thought. Capoeira, big influence again, what because it comes from that streets of being creative using nothing, couple of sticks, and you've got stuff. Um, links of all the here is hand rhythms that we would use very old fashioned, old school ways of being creative to come up with something and emerging, seeing how it fills there. And I've got a great relationship with the guys in Australia, Darren and Winter of Phoenix Movement. They, um, a couple of my coaches, and we use jump rope, rope a lot to be able to deliver rhythm as a component that people generally feel less silly doing. Um, so if you want to have a go at this double side swing, heel, toe, and post your attempts to uh, my Instagram, Luke at underscore B2R, uh, I'll be happy to, to give some feedback. Um, so references are, are all in there. And there's Jake, he's our photographer and he's our, also our trainer. Um, thanks very much for, um, for, for
for joining in. If uh, you found that helpful, then um, I hope that really sparked something for you to build on. Um, you can find more out about us on our social media, Luke underscore B2R, anyone underscore B2R. So we have a franchise and mentorship program now, and we also run the academic curriculum in, in Wyock through Paul underscore B2R. He's also presenting here this weekend at our self-management lecture. Um, and keep an eye out for our CPD events. Hopefully see you guys in person at some point, but if nothing else other than you've had your... Um, mind open to some ideas to really build with and run with here that is the ultimate thing that i could have could have wanted to get out of um this session so thanks for having me bobby uh, maybe we do this in person uh next year and we can create workshops where people can get to experience a lot of this um get the links off the document i send him if you want to be able to see um more of the videos because i've linked a lot of videos in with this presentation um, have a great uh, summit and um, take care.